Okay, good evening. My name is Jack Leonard, and I would like to welcome you to the fourth in the lecture series associated with our spring semester Master of Landscape Architecture Interdisciplinary Studio, 100 Year Coastal Resilience Studio, Hampton, Virginia. I hope that you enjoyed last week's guest lecture in the series, Dr. Cindy Palenkas, who presented Living Shoreline Performance and Potential Impacts in the Chesapeake Bay. If you missed Dr. Palenkas' lecture, or any future le lectures, you can watch them on the SAP uh, YouTube channel. Our guest lecture this evening is Kelsey Brooks. This evening, her topic will be Beyond the Shore, Community Engagement and Equity in Coastal Resilience Planning. Kelsey Brooks is a Northern Maryland Regional Watershed Restoration Specialist for Maryland Sea Grant, working closely with local governments, community groups, and nonprofits to address water quality and water quantity challenges facing the region. Formerly, Kelsey was an MS4 stormwater specialist with the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. She earned a master's in city and regional planning, environmental and physical planning concentration, and a BA in ecology and evolutionary biology. So please welcome Kelsey Brooks. I am muted. Hi, all. Um, thank you so much for having me tonight. I'm excited to be here and chat um, with you all about community engagement and equity. So I shared my screen before and then I stopped, which was maybe a mistake. Let's see. Okay. Am I in full screen um, mode for you all? Great. Um, um, let me see if I, I found the chat before too, which I want to have up. So um, I know Dr. Um, Leonard had mentioned that um, with some of the previous presentations um, saved the questions for the end, but I'm, I'm hoping as part of this community engagement presentation to be engaging you all throughout. So I'm going to ask some questions and, and hopefully I'm able to, to manage being in full screen and looking at the chat as well. So uh, let's see. As Dr. Leonard mentioned, my name is uh, Kelsey Brooks. I'm a watershed restoration specialist with um, the University of Maryland and Maryland Sea Grant Extension. Uh, I do wanna start off by talking a little bit about Extension and what we do and what our work is like. Um, uh, my program is a little unusual to be under sort of both of those organizations. Um, I was not familiar with Extension before I took this position, so I, I always do like to explain what it is because I find that people often don't know. So extension comes out of the land grant system. Uh, every state has a land grant institution. Uh, some states have two, Maryland does. Um, the initial land grant institutions were uh, written in uh, to, um, uh, as a congressional act in 1862. And there was a subsequent act uh, primarily in Southern states where uh, segregation was present in 1890 to also designate some HBCUs as land-grant institutions. So in Maryland, University of Maryland is that 1862 school, University of Maryland Eastern Shore uh, is our 1890 or HBCU um, extension uh, institution. Uh, land-grant extension uh, comes out of sort of an agricultural basis. The idea was to connect farmers in the field to cutting edge research at the university but it has really expanded um, from there. So in addition to our traditional agricultural work, um, uh, we also have now urban ag, and there is an extension office in every county in Maryland, as well as in Baltimore City. In Baltimore City, we have a fantastic urban ag agent, so I do like to plug for her. Uh, the other major program areas in land grant extension are 4-H, which is essentially youth development. Yes, someone knows Nia, that's so great. I see that in the chat. Um, and 4-H was also initially coming out of an agricultural space, but has really expanded to include all kinds of STEAM activities, robotics, GIS, leadership, kind of anything youth development across the board. Uh, my program falls under our environmental and natural resources umbrella, but that also includes our, our home horticulture agents or the master gardener coordinators, uh, as well as forestry specialists and uh, energy specialists. And then family consumer sciences, which deals with anything in the home from nutrition to food safety to financial literacy. And so the idea with extension is we are a community based organization that is, again, supposed to connect our uh, university research to people's actual lives. Uh, community engagement is sort of the lifeblood of what we do and 
by being embedded in the, the counties and cities that we work in, um, we are hopefully able to really do good community engagement work. Sea Grant is a newer program to land grant, um, which is not surprising because again, land grant is 150 plus years old at this point. Uh, there are Sea Grant programs, not in every state, but in every coastal state, every Great Lakes state, and also the Good Lakes state of Vermont. Um, and every Sea Grant program is a little different. Ours focuses on uh, stormwater management, um, climate change and coastal resilience, oyster aquaculture, seafood safety and technology, and economics. So I say this uh, as, as uh, partially to just, again, introduce the organization, but also, you know, if you have questions about any of these areas in your lives, we're available. Um, we answer any questions we get, uh, you just have to email or, or call us. So again, my program is a little different because we are housed under both of these organizations. It's a collaborative effort. Uh, because appropriately enough, we work at the land water interface. So my grant, C grant, we're right in the middle, so we get um, input from both. And uh, the overall goal of our watershed protection and restoration program is to assist local governments, nonprofits, and communities in achieving uh, measurable improvements in water quality and addressing water quantity concerns. Historically, our program has been really focused on water quality because of the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Uh, but we are increasingly being brought into conversations about water quantity. And if you all know anything about the history of stormwater management, um, you will know that initially the focus was on water quantity and then we moved into water quality and we are now hopefully getting to a place where we are really considering both in an integrated fashion. Um, we do this work in a variety of ways. Uh, we do capacity building work uh, with our local government partners with community groups that can look like facilitating meetings that can look like um, helping with grants assistance, which is the next thing on our list. Um, it can look like providing technical assistance um, across a variety of metrics. We do volunteer training, which empowers individual uh, community residents to be able to address uh, their local uh, problems and concerns. We help directly with project implementation, and then we do general education and outreach. So that can, again, look like tabling. It can look like lectures. And I am one of five people in this position throughout the state. Uh, we each have a different region. and. Um, Dr. Leonard mentioned at the top, I cover Northern Maryland, uh, which we call Carroll, Baltimore, Hartford counties and Baltimore City. So yes, this is, is, this is the program that I'm working in. And I'll say this presentation was a little bit different for me to put together. So I'm used to presenting to folks about specifically stormwater management and not necessarily about the process that we use to do our work. So how we go about doing community engagement um, and definitely in thinking about that and thinking about how I wanted to talk to you all about it, um, it took me back to my own time as a student and being in studio courses and thinking about um, sort of the time limitation that comes with, right? So you are all working on this project over the course of the semester. Um, you're, the time you have to build relationships to do uh, a, you know, a well-designed community engagement plan uh, is somewhat limited, but I think there are still ways you can consider community engagement as you're developing your plans, uh, and there are ways to do things better and ways to do things worse. So not to spend too much of this presentation talking about myself, but I do want to start out with a little bit of an anecdote of um, where we did not do community engagement very well as part of a student studio, and then at the end I'll come back to an example of where um, a student studio led to additional work and additional projects. So I believe uh, the first uh, speaker I sat in in a couple of the presentations had talked about the way that Hurricane Sandy really changed um, sort of the field of, of coastal resilience and coastal resilience planning. And that is always interesting for me to hear because I did do my master's in city and regional planning at Rutgers. And the two years I was in graduate school were the two years that New Jersey got pummeled by hurricanes. Uh, the first year I was there, we got Irene. The second year we got Sandy. Um, they were kind of interesting events to have back to back because Irene was a rain event that caused a ton of inland flooding. And then Sandy was, of course, a wind event, which had a lot of coastal impacts, inland impacts as well, but um, sort of different. So going into my second year with my studio courses, um, we were already sort of pivoting a lot of the students toward water management issues because of Irene. 
Um, and the studio that I did my first semester was to develop a green infrastructure plan for Milltown, New Jersey. Uh, Milltown is a small town, uh, but its claim to fame was they had their own electrical substation. Now, unfortunately for them, uh, as a result of Irene, that electrical substation was also built at the bottom of essentially a bowl in the middle of town. Uh, and so when flooding happened after Irene, uh, they had a major uh, critical infrastructure issue. And so we came in and we developed a, a green infrastructure plan. We were working with the city council um, and then we left. And I have long asked myself the question, did anything happen with all those wonderful uh, small scale best management practices that we suggested with the park redevelopment that we suggested? Is that something the community wanted? Is that something the local government wanted? I don't know. And this has come back to me in some ways because now I work with my colleagues at Rutgers Extension. And during our time in our studio, we didn't reach out to them at all to talk to them about um, what could be done to add continuity to the work that we were doing. Because I think ideally, right, not only will you be um, designing these coastal resilience plans, but someone will take that and either directly implement it or use it as the basis of something else. And so um, my colleague at Rutgers Extension, the guy who sort of runs their watershed work, Chris Abrupta, I've talked to him about this and he, he disagreed that we probably should have talked to him uh, as we were doing the studio. But to me, the funniest thing is they went back to Milltown years later. So our studio was in 2012. Um, this is a, a presentation that they put together about some bioretentions they installed at an elementary school in Milltown. And you can see their process started in 2014. And yes, it took longer than a, a, about a year, so longer than a semester that we had to work on it. Um, but still, I have to wonder if there's something more integrated we could have done. And so I think the takeaway uh, for me from this and what I, I hope uh, to communicate through this presentation is that it is useful to think about um, community engagement in any sort of plan development process. And that can be as straightforward as thinking through who can you connect with that will be able to take your work and either operationalize it or use it in some way after you've finished. Um, I'm going to be talking sort of through um, uh, essentially the seven core principles of community engagement. And so it's you know beyond the scope again of probably what you all will be able to accomplish. But I still think there are things you can take from it for this project, as well as I hope things you'll take with you throughout your career. I'm gonna leave you all with a number of, of really great resources that you can dive into at length. Um, uh, that again, maybe not fully for this project, but certainly moving forward, I hope you all consider as you continue to do this kind of work. So, um, really what it ends up boiling down to and what we didn't do, and this is from the Community Driven Climate Resilience Plan, uh, planning a framework from the National Association of Climate Resilience Planners is, when climate resilience planning processes are conducted without community capacity to vision and to build power, they can become empty investments, simply producing a plan that sits on a shelf with little chance of being implemented. And that of course is what we're trying to avoid. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to, to cover. Um, I'm gonna start off with sort of the general framework that informs kind of all the work I do around socioecological systems, which is a resilience framework. I don't know how much you all have dived into something like that uh, in the past, but I wanna make sure that um, we sort of define our terms and are working from the same place. I think what's really useful about a resilience framework is, um, well, it doesn't necessarily speak explicitly to equity. I think there are a lot more opportunities for equity to be embedded in that process because it really is always asking the question for what and for who, which are really important. I'm then gonna dive into those seven core principles of community engagement, provide some definitions, walk through those principles. And while I don't have like a separate slide on equity, it's gonna be built into the whole conversation. Um, and then I'm going to leave you again with some, some resources, which will hopefully be helpful. I was looking at your syllabus and I saw that one of your sort of assignments for um, the first few weeks was, or some of you, 
was this idea of like defining resilience. So I'd be curious if anyone could put into the chat, when I say resilience, when I say we want a resilient system, what are you thinking about? And so maybe, you know, I'll, I'll breeze through the next couple of slides because we're all already on the same page, but um, we'll find out. We'll give everyone, a, probably should have set the question as I was walking through the slide as opposed to leaving us all uh, hanging as people enter things in. It's also okay if we don't have any thoughts. Okay. Okay, so uh, from Mara, we have resilience recovering to a state of stability after disturbance. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly, or pretty close to what we mean. So this is another resource. This was sort of the, the primer on resilience thinking that I was introduced to through my ecology coursework. And it's a really good little book. Um, it is not a huge textbook. It is not a huge tome. It is not like, you know, $150 to purchase. Um, it's by Walker and Salt. It's called Resilience Thinking, uh, Sustaining Ecosystems and People in a Changing World. So Mara is right. Uh, a resilient system has the ability um, to absorb disturbance and still retain its basic function and structure. Um, but I'd also add in a little bit that um, uh, the services, it can service current systems demands without eroding the potential to meet future needs. Yeah, Ali said, being able to bounce back post disaster event, maintain economic and social development while maintaining healthy ecological systems in the face of climate change. So yeah, got it. So there are a couple of, of um, I would say deeper elements of resilience thinking that I also wanna pull out um, that I think are really important to think about as you're developing this coastal resilience plan, as you're hopefully looking to ensure equity. Uh, another term I wanna quickly define, which I tend to think sounds self-explanatory, but sometimes you've been working in a field for so long that <laughs> you're like, maybe it's not, um, which is the idea of socio-ecological systems or social ecological systems. Um, and a couple definitions, one a little bit, um, I think more concrete, one a bit more philosophical. So a social ecological systems are interdependent and linked systems of people and nature connected across scales. Um, it reflects that people are part of ecosystems and shape them from local to global scales and are at the same time fundamentally dependent on the capacity of these systems to provide services for human well-being and societal development. So this diagram is sort of an example of that. You've got your people and nature embedded on a landscape scale, then a regional scale, then a global scale. And this is all occurring over time, obviously, as most things are. I also like this definition from Enforce and Kotsky, or Enforce Kotsky, um, which is that the term emphasizes that humans are part of nature and that the delineation between social and ecological systems is artificial, uh, which I think is really true. Uh, I work a lot in highly ultra urbanized spaces, and I think there's definitely a tendency in the way we use language for people to think that nature is somewhere else. And it definitely is not. It, we are in nature all the time. Um, and I think that's important as you're, you're designing your systems. So the first of the sort of principles that I want to pull out of this framework is uh, about efficiency and sort of about the, the pitfalls of efficiency and how efficiency often doesn't lead to resilience. So Walker and Salt will tell us that um, being efficient in a narrow sense leads to elimination of redundancies keeping on those things that are directly and immediately beneficial. This kind of efficiency leads to drastic losses in resilience. Efficiency per se is not the problem, but when it is applied to only a narrow range of values and a particular set of interests, it sets the system on a trajectory that due to its complex nature leads inevitably to unwanted outcomes. So I think an example that is really relevant uh, to this project and one that you all have been sort of talking around with the discussions of living shorelines versus um, sort of um, gray engineered hard infrastructure um, is a project that's going on uh, in uh, the Turner Station area of Dundalk. So this is Fleming Park. Um, and historically, Fleming Park, which is a majority African-American community, had a beach and they would go fishing and they would go crabbing and it was a community amenity and a community resource. Uh, there was a lot of infrastructure development down in that area and the shoreline started to erode. So their solution 
uh, was to add riprap and hard infrastructure to reduce the beach erosion. That also effectively right, made it a not inviting space. You're not gonna wanna scramble over hard jagged rocks to get to your waterfront. And essentially this community lost an amenity. And as you can see from the top photo, that's, those are the current conditions. Um, Phragmites moved in. So they basically have a monoculture stand of Phragmites and then a bunch of rocks and then the waterfront. So in many ways, right, this, this solution was optimized for the um, limited issue, the scale of the beach, um, the issue of shoreline erosion, and to be fair, the shoreline has stopped eroding. But if you pull out a scale to the, the community, to the neighborhood, you have a lot of unintended consequences. You reduce beach access. It's not, it wasn't really a tourism destination, but potentially in other areas where you have similar issues, you reduce tourism. You've reduced its ability to serve as a community hub and an opportunity for community cohesion. And while anything that's directly adjacent to the shoreline that was threatened uh, by that erosion uh, is probably better off. If you live up the block, right, and you used to have a property whose value was positively impacted by being next to a beach, well, you no longer live next to a beach and that can and have a, a reverse impact, right, on your, on your property values. So this is a good example, right, of yes, it's an efficient solution to this specific problem, but maybe not uh, a resilient solution for the community. It also gets to the concept of scales. Um, which is really embedded in resilience thinking. And so ignoring the effects of one scale on another, cross-scale effects is one of the most common reasons for failures in natural resource management systems. It's often people concentrate solely on the scale of direct interest to them. So in that example, right, again, the beach, but the structures and the dynamics at that scale and how the system can and will respond to that scale strongly depends on the states and dynamics of the system at the scales above and below. So again, there's a concept called panarchy, and it's just the idea of um, these hierarchies of linked adapted cycles operating at different scales. The structure and dynamics of the systems at each scale is driven by a small set of key processes, and in turn uh, is linked, uh, this linked set of hierarchies that govern the behavior of the whole system. So if you're nice, then you lose. And so another, I think, relevant example of this um, is something I recently learned about. So one of the capacity building facilitation uh, projects that our group has recently taken on is the coordination of the Baltimore Urban Waters Partnership, uh, which is a federal regional program that brings together um, uh, people working on, on um, water quantity and water quality issues in the Baltimore area. And we have a subgroup called our Actionable Science Flood Team, which hosted a uh, flood science and policy workshop uh, last July. And in case anyone is interested in diving into this particular presentation a little bit more, I have provided the link to this summary, which has the link to the presentation, as well as a video of the presentation. But Dr. Ming Li from UMC's The One Point Lab uh, gave this really interesting presentation on the impacts of climate change and coastline management on inundation in Baltimore and Chesapeake Bay. And the thing that I wanted to pull out of this presentation was this discussion of um, sort of hard and soft uh, shoreline protections and the impacts it has on a regional scale again. So yes, the scale you're looking at may be um, a, an individual community, but what's happening regionally at this scale above. So uh, their modeling found that by 2100, the tidal range in the upper bay could increase by 10 centimeters in a hard shoreline scenario or decrease by 10 centimeters in a soft shoreline scenario. This is because tides in the Chesapeake Bay are generated by the deep ocean and come into the bay as tidal waves. Soft shorelines dissipate the energy of these waves through friction before they reach the bay more than hard shorelines do. To protect Baltimore from rising sea level and high tide flooding, policymakers and jurisdictions in the Chesapeake region will need to seriously discuss these different coastal management approaches for addressing sea level rise and increased inundation. So can you all see my mouse? Um, I'm gonna point at some things. Okay, I see more nodding, so I hope that, okay, great. So I believe that your project area is sort of down here. Um, this is the, the Hampton area, and of course, we in sort of Baltimore up here, right? So under this, these are your present conditions, right? This is your soft um, approach, uh, and this is if 
people put in a lot of hard seawalls, right? And so there are trade-offs down in Hampton and everyone goes with sort of soft um, uh, approaches to shoreline management. You do have an increased tidal range within this lower part of the bay, but if folks are putting in hard barriers in the lower part of the bay, you end up with much higher um, sea level rise uh, in the sort of Baltimore area. And I think part of uh, Dr. Lee's point as well, right, and this is always a difficult thing to, to manage and wrap your mind around is um, thinking through resilience and thinking through equity, there are always trade-offs. So it's not only a question of, um, uh, you know, how many people are impacted, but like the cost of infrastructure that's impacted. Um, and there probably is no right or wrong answer as with any sort of ethical <laughs> questions, but um, it is worth considering, right? It's worth considering and it's helpful to know that if all these individual private landowners put in hard infrastructure, it's going to have significant impacts elsewhere. And so how does um, regional local government manage um, regulations around what people can or can't do? Uh, I got a question. So does the size of tidal range correlate to overall sea level rise or does sea level rise stay the same in both scenarios, but there's less tidal fluctuation with the soft shoreline scenario? So I believe that um, the sea level rise is the same. Yeah, impacts of one meter sea level rise on tidal range. So in both cases, the sea level has risen one meter. It's just a question of that that range again. So um, uh, you know, is the during high tide how much higher is high tide going to be um, in each scenario? Um, does that answer the question? Okay, I can I can't see everyone unfortunately as I'm going through this presentation, but you are on my screen, so I see you nodding. That's great. Okay. So yeah, I do want to just set that framework of, of resilience thinking because it really does help me sort of work through these issues. Um, and again, centering people and not just this question of like what's the most cost effective, what's the most efficient solution for this small problem at hand. But it brings the question of, I think you guys have been really focusing on the geophysical and ecological uh, elements of your project so far. So how do we integrate the socio or the social into our socio-ecological system resilience planning in an equitable and just way? And the answer is community engagement. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the long and short of it. I was maybe working on this presentation too late at night, so I got into the word art. Um, this is uh, another just diagram of what like a resilience planning process looks like. So time for another question for you all. Um, you can look at this pretty quickly, but where do you think is the point in this diagram where you would want to start a community engagement process or perform your community engagement process? I'm seeing ones, two ones. Yeah, you guys got it. It was it was a bit of a trick question. The answer is everywhere. You want to take a community engagement through the whole process if possible. Sometimes that's more difficult, and we'll we'll get into the you know the realities of, of that. So citizens, just a quick definition again, so we're all on the same page of what community engagement means. This is from um, the Center for Rural Pennsylvania, of all places, but it's a really workable definition. Citizens of a community are engaged when they play an effective role in decision making. That means they are actively involved in defining the issues. So again, that preparation phase, right? Identifying solutions and developing priorities for action and resources. This change requires letting go of some of the traditional reins of power and depending on the jurisdiction you're working with, that can be really difficult. Um, and trusting that citizens can and will effectively engage in the issues. So that's what we mean when we say community engagement. This is from the National Coalition for Dialogue and Deliberation. I think it's a really useful framework. These are again, these seven core principles of community engagement. And we were just going to walk through these um, and sort of considerations and things to think about when it comes to each step. So the first step is uh, appropriately enough, careful prep planning and preparation. I know I said the community engagement starts right at the beginning, but it is also reasonable to start off with a bit of a desktop assessment. So depending on where you're coming into 
a project process. You do want to write gather background information uh, about the community that you're going to be working with. And so I know you all are getting into that portion of the project of um, the sort of individual neighborhoods or, or portions of the region that you're going to be working with. Um, Dr. Leonard mentioned that you all are having a meeting with some folks from the communities uh, next week, which is really cool. Um, so desktop assessment can be, you know, looking at current conditions, gathering demographics from census information, um, using mapping tools to identify again, critical infrastructure, which might need to be protected, uh, as well as public resources, like schools, which is also critical infrastructure, parks, um, public beaches, again. You may want to see if you can find any sort of archival or historical information about whether something used to be a beach, how it could have functioned in the community in the past. Uh, that can also look like more recent historical conditions of maybe this area rapidly developed in the last 10 or 15 years. So the conditions of how water moves through the area have really changed. Um, some of that analysis, right, you can do by hand, but there are also really great existing tools. I know the, the SERP folks have provided a number of resources, which I'm sure you all got, but I didn't see a ton of resources around social vulnerability. So one useful tool, which I've screenshotted here, um, it's sort of a quick and dirty way to assess a community and social vulnerability is EPA's environmental justice screen. So, um, you know, this is easy to Google and find, and it allows you to look at both environmental indicators um, and demographic indicators um, and kind of assess what parts of this community are more vulnerable. So I believe <laughs> this is the area of Hampton that you all are looking at. And I have up the demographic uh, index, which is a combination of the percentage of people of color and the low income population specifically. But there's other demographic um, layers they have built in. You can kind of see, right, which are the more vulnerable parts of this region. So it's really helpful. You may also want to look at existing plans and projects, right? So we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of continuity and community engagement. So if there's any work or outreach that has been done in the past, it's useful to know about. So you can start to connect um, dots for people as they continue to or start to be involved. So you've done your desktop assessment. And again, this is um, sort of an ideal situation. I think it also not necessarily accounting for COVID, which makes everything more difficult. Um, and then you might want to start to think about logistics as you're planning out a community engagement process. So that can be as simple as where are meetings hosted. Um, not all places seem equally accessible to all people or equally welcoming to all people and not all places are equally accessible. So that can be a challenge, um, especially if you're working with vulnerable or underserved communities. It's important to identify barriers to participation. Transportation is frequently a significant barrier. Um, day of the week can be a barrier, time of day, the length of the meeting. Uh, this can be determined through conversations, through interviews, through surveys. Um, and it's also important to consider any accommodations that participants who are able to attend um, might need. So, you know, I think a classic example of this is oftentimes planning meetings are held in the evening with the idea that um, it's not during the work hours for citizens who may want to attend. And I don't know if any of you have ever attended like a local town's planning meetings, um, but oftentimes it's a bit of an, an older crowd. Uh, and I think one thing that is difficult to think through, if like you're a younger person, you have kids, evening meetings can also be difficult to attend to. So it can be a question of, of providing multiple options for people. Um, you can never underestimate the power of having food at meetings. <laughs> um, it is always a nice thing to have. And interestingly enough, we've been doing a lot of um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work uh, uh, um, in my organization. And we've done some work around implicit bias. And they point out, I think really importantly, that um, when people are uncomfortable when they're hungry, when they're thirsty, when they're hot, when they're cold. Um, it's like harder to access your frontal lobes and participate in a meaningful way. So like the idea of being hangry is very real um, and providing food um, uh, can help ameliorate some of that. Depending on who you're working with, so again, with underserved communities, it can also be really important and, and helpful to provide um, different kinds of incentives. And these can be monetary incentives. Um, sometimes people uh, need help to participate. Um, and also, right, 
well, you are working on a plan that should hopefully benefit the community that you're working with, you are asking in some ways for their labor as well to put together a plan. And I will say that one thing we run into um, as well, depending on the community, um, some places are really sort of overstudied and under delivered to. So they'll be reached out um, to a lot piecemeal, not so much as part of a planning process. This happens, I think, a lot more um, from a research perspective. And then there don't seem to be any outcomes. Um, so it can be helpful to um, provide incentives. And then other support. So the Turner Station example I was talking about with um, their um, intent to um, redesign that the waterfront area that had been rip wrapped. Um, I went to one of the community meetings and it was at a school that is uh, right in the center of the community. And uh, we were in the gym and there was a side room off the gym where they had a setup for the kids to be. And so they could be away from the meeting. There was a couple of adults kind of keeping an eye on them, but you know, they were right there. Um, and it allowed their parents to be a little bit more engaged while they were occupied playing and, and coloring and doing whatever they were doing. The last thing, which of course we are getting more into now is this idea of online versus in person. There are certainly benefits and drawbacks to both options. Um, in many ways, being online makes people makes it easier for people to attend, uh, but that assumes that they have internet access, which depending on where you're working is not always the case. Um, you can't also run into issues, right, where people are just not very technologically savvy, <laughs> um, and that can be a whole separate issue. Uh, In-person provides the opportunity to do different kinds of engagement as well, right? So if you're doing like a real charrette system where people are drawing on maps together, that's much more difficult to do in an online format. Um, and I think we'll find, right, I'm sure there are studies being done right now, whether or not because we've adjusted to an online framework is that has allowed us to kind of better participate uh through zoom or if there really is still something to being in person with people and seeing their full body language and knowing that they're completely present um i think we probably can't get away from that idea quite yet so this is from the national coalition for dialogue and deliberation this is a separate document from the one that i quoted before this is a research research resource rather <laughs> guide on public engagement and I was introduced to this document through a facilitation training that I did. But as you can see, there are a ton of different ways to structure an outreach process. Um, and they have very helpfully put together a matrix of sort of what you're trying to accomplish, how many people you have that you're trying to reach, what uh, time period you have to do it, what kind of participants you would want to include. And I will not pretend that I can tell you exactly what a Boom dialogue is because I have not used that one yet, but it's a really useful, um, handy thing to have to think through that public engagement, and this is really true, right? Isn't just a meeting here or there that people can show up and say their piece. Um, that's not a true community engagement process. And there's a lot of different ways to really structure um, different parts of your community engagement um, process and procedure. So the next thing um, that's just sort of uh, all the things you want to think about while planning and getting started. You also want to think about inclusion uh, and demographic diversity. Um, this idea of reaching out, but also inviting in. So um, we also just attended uh, at my organization a DI training where um, our, our facilitator talked about the difference between diversity and inclusion. So diversity, he said, is inviting people to a dance. Inclusion is finding out what kind of music they like and playing it and encouraging them to dance as well. Um, and I think that's a really great way of explaining that, that difference. So that again speaks to your preparation and, and how you're setting things up. But it can be difficult to identify community leaders and whose voice you really need to hear, particularly if they have felt that they have not been um, properly included in the process before because that may discourage them from participating in the future. So one thing um, that uh, is still important, right, is that desktop, desktop assessment. We talk a ton about a parity in extension, and that's just the idea of what a representative group looks like, right, is going to vary by where you are. So I think, if I can go back a couple of slides, 
um, with this EJ screen, right, there is this option to, when you're looking at the percentiles, to compare to the US or compare to the state. And that's really important, right? Because in the case of Virginia, if I'm trying to create an advisory group that looks like the community I'm working in, it is important to think of what I mean by that. So if I'm uh, thinking about parity in terms of the United States, right, then my advisor group is 13% black. If I'm thinking about parity in terms of the state of Virginia, then my advisory group is like, I think it's 19 or 20% black. I looked up the demographics of Hampton, Virginia. If I'm thinking about parity for that city, it's 50% black, right? And so those are radically different numbers, 13, 20, 50, um, not the same. And so when you're trying to have a representative group, you do have to first define sort of that bounds of community and what you mean. And not to say that race is the only factor you should be considering when, when creating a diverse group. I think it is just illustrative. Um, you can collect data about who you should be including in any process. And I know, again, you all are talking to some community representatives uh, next week. And so that's sort of like an interview process, right? And that is often a great way to start. So sometimes it's easier to identify certain groups who should be brought in and part of the conversation. And they may know other people in more underrepresented groups who you should then reach out to, right? So it's not a case of just Googling and hoping for the best. So um, you can use surveys to try to figure out who should be brought in. Uh, you can use focus groups um, and developing a really good focus group is a pretty intensive process in and of itself. Or you can use structured or even non-structured interviews to try to figure out who might be able, so again, in this case of this um, uh, uh, project to continue the work. Is there like a watershed group you should talk to who might be able to um, continue to push for whatever you end up designing? Again, it's also important to consider who has historically not been at the table and who is the most vulnerable. And that can be socially, it can be economically. In the case of coastal resilience, right, it can be spatially, so who's closest to the shore. Advertisement is really hard and increasingly hard as you know we get more fractured in what we're looking at. I think historically for a lot of planning processes, right, the community engagement is like you put something in the newspaper, you have a public meeting, there you've done your community engagement. But in terms of, of reaching groups or people who maybe aren't even part of any of the networks you're able to access, it's, it's really hard um, because our digital world is so fractured. So like uh, we do advertisement for our volunteer training program that we run and one of our partners in one of the counties we work in had a great idea of running an ad on the radio which was really cool, we hadn't done that before. And then I realized like, I don't listen to the radio anymore. I would never hear that advertisement. A lot of people don't get physical newspapers. So um, really thinking about where people get their information from and figuring out how to best get that out. Obviously social media is an option now, um, but we know like algorithms still sort of curate your, themselves. So it's it's not clear that you're, you're reaching outside of your existing networks. Language is also something to consider. It's something to consider with equity at all times. This is a roadblock as well because translation costs money. And I know I haven't mentioned money at all yet, um, but obviously most things cost money. Um, but depending on the demographics of the community you're working with, and I think the EJ screen has an option for um, non-English speakers who so might be able to quickly see um, what the language diversity is in that region. Um, having things in another language can be really important. Uh, you also want to consider diversity in terms of sectors, right? So these are just a couple boxes. It's worthwhile considering hit. You've got your government, local, state, federal, depending on what scale you're working at. Elected officials can be really helpful to have on your side, um, although difficult to get. You have your traditional environmental NGOs um, who are probably invested in the, the type of environmental planning work that you're looking at. It's always great to engage the private sector, I find that to also be a bit of struggle as well. And that can be anything from tourism, development, those businesses that are directly on the coast. Um, if you can get foundations involved, because again, they have money, that's really helpful. Um, community groups, so community development corporations, neighborhood associations. I put environmental justice orgs in community groups and not with the other environmental NGOs. And I did that purposefully, <laughs> not on accident. A lot of times environmental justice groups are a lot more place-based than sort of traditional environmental NGOs. And also a lot of times those two groups don't 
work super well um, together. Um, the justice groups are a little bit more community oriented and frankly, oftentimes they don't look like each other and as a result, don't necessarily see themselves as partners, um, which is something to, to consider as you're navigating um, these sectors and relationships. Um, arts and cultural organizations are another community group and it's always great to bring in youth leaders as well um, uh, into any project. And then this is the last plug I will put in for extension, um, but having academia brought in as well, individual researchers who are working on aligned issues who have done work in the community, um, any centers um, that may have continued work, ongoing work that they're doing. And then again, just one last plug for extension. Um, the next is collaboration and shared purpose of the core principles. Um, Cogeneration is a really hot term right now in research and it's getting back at that idea of bringing people in at the initial stage so that your participants, your community is helping to define the issues that you're addressing. So they have buy-in from the start and that you're not coming to them and telling them, coming to them and saying, here's a problem you have. And them saying, that's not a problem we have. They're then involved in the process of developing solutions, prioritizing action, um, and you can get buy-in all the way through. I'm gonna talk very, very briefly at the end about conflict and conflict resolution, because that's a whole separate topic. But one way to really get people on the same page is to start with highlighting shared values and goals, as well as shared concerns. Because sometimes people are in an argument and they're sort of talking past each other at the same thing. So you've established like, you know, we all want safe communities. We all want communities that don't flood. We all want good property values. Um, that can be helpful in, in uh, helping people to understand that, yes, we're all working towards these same goals. It's just a matter of figuring out a way to get there for everyone. Uh, openness and learning uh, is the next important core principle. Um, this is another thing which, of course, comes with a cost, but is really great if you can have it, uh, which is an impartial facilitator. So depending on who you're working with uh, and depending on the history of the community you're working with, there can be a long um, history of distrust. Uh, I definitely feel that coming from the University of Maryland, uh, that some communities have had bad experiences with, um, I think also right in the city with Hopkins and UMD, and it definitely takes worse work to overcome um, that view and, and showing up and being a good partner over time. Uh, you definitely always want to set ground rules for how you're going to be exchanging information. This can also be a helpful way of not letting someone sabotage a meeting. So if you say, you know, everyone gets to speak for two minutes and share their views and be very strict about that. So it is equitable, but you're ensuring that, that no one's just um, going off uh, for a long period of time. Uh, you want to, again, have that be an, ex be an exchange. So balancing external experts, you all will be coming in as experts in your field, but it's always important to recognize that communities are also experts in their experience, right? Everyone brings expertise to these meetings. It's a different kind of expertise. Uh, it's a different orientation, but it's important to have everyone understand that they are valued and that um, what they're bringing to the table is important in the process. And then again, depending on the time you have and how long you're engaged with this community, it may be important to provide additional opportunities to sort of bring different parts of communities up to speed. So it's one thing to have a large public meeting where you present your, your plans and then find out, right, that there's something fundamental about the way you're talking or what you're talking about that portions of the community don't understand. And so you can go back and provide additional education without having to have that be in your sort of general meeting that's useful. And I think that also goes back to that long list of, of interventions, right? So it's not one, it's, it's multiple interventions that you might need to take on. Uh, having transparency and building trust is obviously invaluable. Uh, and I think the most important part uh, of this component of a public engagement plan is setting clear expectations. It is really amazing what core expectations will do to derail a process because if people think you can do more than you can do, uh, and then find out they can't, right? 
that leads to disappointment uh, and often uh, people stepping back. So it's really good to clearly define what is and what isn't possible. Uh, and that can be as simple as saying, you know, we're working with Hampton, Virginia. What the city can do is constrained by what the state says they can do, what the feds say they can do. So you might say, this is what is within the city's power. It's good to set expectations what the process will look like and to walk people through the process the whole way so they understand why things are set up the way they're set up, why you're doing the things you're doing, what the outcomes are going to be, as well as any sort of um, process that you do behind the scenes. So, you know, why were certain choices made as why were certain choices eliminated or not considered. Um, and that uh, comes as well with um, being open about uncertainty, clearly explaining risks, clearly explaining alternatives. Um, again, why things were weren't considered, and then making sure that you do follow up. So, um, right, this is the difficult part of your studio course, because again, you're here for a semester. So what is the follow up going to be with any community members you end up engaging with? Uh, but it's definitely frustrating, right, to start along a process and then a partner just disappears. And that happens multiple times and over time with an over underserved community that can be very frustrating and difficult. Then want to think about impact and action at the end. Um, some of that is in the process of empowering communities. So through the process of community engagement, you are hopefully also empowering communities to do more for themselves. Uh, and so that's what we call capacity building, right? Imparting knowledge, imparting skills, giving them the tools to continue the work. Uh, on their own, the tools to apply for grants, the tools to implement small scale projects, the tools to advocate for themselves, to know where to go to ask for questions. You want to develop methods for evaluation, which is part of that transparency, right, and that follow up to say, these are the goals that we set, this is how we did, these are our clear metrics, um, this is the impact we've had, and then to clearly show the community how their uh, input has influenced the outcome so that again, they feel empowered and it shows them that what they provided really matters and has had an impact on the process. And then finally, um, this last core principle of sustained engagement and participatory culture. Um, and I think, again, right, this is the question of within this process of a studio course, what does this end up look like? So, it can be uh, finding a hub or anchor organization um, to carry on this work as we're doing uh, community engagement, maybe from a different perspective. Uh, once you get out into your careers, you can actually lead that process and maintain that portion of the project that helps to maintain the continuity of work. So you know, at the beginning, you're looking at existing plans and seeing how your project fits into those existing plans, but you want something to continue afterwards. And so it really is the question of who will be there when you leave um, in a, a true community engagement development plan. Um, uh, hopefully that can eventually be the community. Hopefully eventually you build enough capacity into the community that they are an experts across the board um, and you can move on with your work as well. So some common challenges uh, that we run into with community engagement is definitely conflict. Um, this is also from Penn State, and I think I didn't mention it at the beginning when I first talked about that, um, that uh, rural communities guide, but uh, Penn State Extension has a ton of really great resources on community engagement. They have a whole set of modules and training videos, um, and they're pretty concise and sort of easy to work through, so I have linked that as well, but really recommend um, Penn State Extension as a, as a resource. I know I said I wasn't going to mention Extension again. Oh, no, <laughs> I failed at doing that. Um, but uh, so this is this, you know, a map of, of what conflict in, a, in the planning process can look like. Um, you start with tension development and um, you move to a role dilemma, which is the question of who's doing what, who's responsible, who's doing what to me. Uh, it then transitions into what they call injustice collecting, which is this idea of, you know, groups really looking for evidence that they are being aggrieved as opposed to sort of possibly participating in the work. It can lead to confrontation, which I think is a little self-evident. And then hopefully there are some adjustments from each side 
but that doesn't always resolve the tension. So another thing that I've learned in training, right, is that there is a real difference between compromise and consensus. Compromise frequently still leads to people obviously not being totally happy with the outcome and feeling aggrieved, whereas consensus is comes from a place of um, finding almost a third way or something that everyone can agree to, and you tend to result uh, tends to result in fewer sort of uh, like long-term festering issues. And so what is the intervention in this conflict cycle? And it is a lot of what those core principles that we've sort of walked through. So tension can come from people feeling like uh, something's again happening to them, that they're being brought into the process late, that uh, a local government is telling them what's going to happen about feeling a lack of agency in a process. Um, and that's also part of the role dilemma um, question as well. And uh, the intervention obviously with that is to bring people into the process as soon as possible to help empower them to feel as if, uh, and not just to feel as if, but to show them that their input is, is valuable. Um, and uh, to ensure that they understand why things are happening, right? And so, so frequently, plans get down the road and then yes, the public are brought in and misinformation has spread. Um, uh, uh, certain groups have, have run with that misinformation and said, again, this is a thing that's happening to us. So I think about, right, uh, whenever I think about misinformation in the stormwater field, I think about um, uh, the rain tax <laughs> um, uh, uh, kerfuffle that happened uh, when Governor Hogan was, was running for election and this idea that uh, people thought that uh, we were taxing how much it rained as opposed to having fees around impervious cover and that regardless of whether or not there was a separate fee, you would be paying for stormwater management from your tax dollars, like regardless. Um, and that always comes to my mind as an example of, of something that really got away uh, from people in terms of, of information because obviously no one is taxing the rain. So thinking through a community engagement plan, what are the clear resource needs as well? Um, and so, you know, if you're developing an ideal long running community capacity building community engagement plan, what do you need? You need time, which you all <laughs> really have, right? Uh, if you have underserved communities, which have been um, disinvested in over time, simply trust building can take years of work um, before you start to even see any process and any work on individual issues. And that is literally showing up routinely. It looks like having uh, literal infrastructure, spaces, places where people can meet and do the work. And so again, right, thinking through what is an equitable place, what is a place people can get to, where can we hold these meetings? It is people. Uh, you need a lot of people to run a good community engagement plan and if you can get a separate facilitator, that's ideal. But still, right, if you need someone to be showing up at meetings um, every month, right, and you're doing that with as many communities as you hope to be engaging with, that is a lot of people power. Uh, and then finally, you need supplies, whether or not that's food, whether or not that's the materials to run a proper charrette. Um, whether or not that is uh, technology, um, mapping, uh, uh, whatever else. So these are kind of, you know, your main components. You can think through what you all have. So the other last thing, sort of my last idea that I want to leave you all with is resilience, as much as it is about a system absorbing shocks, is also, right, not just about um, uh, the, whatever you end up building, right? whether it is a living shoreline or a seawall. Having a community that is resilient to shocks is also about um, really that social aspect, that community cohesion. And so one of the things about developing a good community engagement plan and about building community capacity is you're also doing resilience work for that. So this is again uh, from the Community Driven Climate Resilience Planning Framework from our National Association of Climate Resilience Planners Friends. They say community-driven community climate resilience planning builds community leadership and directly connects members to one another in dynamic solutions-oriented processes. This level of social cohesion, civic participation, and ultimately community stewardship are paramount to human climate resilience. 
So having communities that understand the processes, that understand what's happening, and that can build, again, additional social resources on the backs of whatever planning process is occurring is essential to true um, community resilience. So I said at the beginning, right, with my anecdote about my own student experience and, and how the outcome was a little uh, disappointing in retrospect, that, that doesn't have to be the case. Um, and a counterexample is actually tied to that, um, that beachfront in Dundalk. So their process started with a student studio at Cornell. I don't know why it was Cornell and not a more local university, but who's to say how these processes work? So Cornell, um, uh, through their landscape architecture program, um, did this design with dredge project. And they were working with the uh, landscape architecture firm, Mayhem Reichel, uh, as, uh, as well, I think, as well as another organization. I can't remember who it was off the top of my head. And essentially what this project was is they did an assessment of what our dredge materials could be used throughout sort of the, the Baltimore area. So these would be um, dredge materials taken from the Inner Harbor, which is a whole ongoing project of what to do with those. Um, and they not only evaluated what those projects could look like, but also where dredge material projects could be placed. And one of the locations that came out of that project was um, Fleming Park. Uh, and because they um, left it in the hands of an appropriate person or appropriate organization, this project has continued. And um, again, hopefully thinking about um, your future careers beyond the studio, Mayhem Reichel has been really great about leading this process and bringing in partners to help with the community engagement components. Um, they've been working closely with the Bay Foundation, um, as well as a local community development organization, the Turner Station Conservation Team, uh, to keep this process moving. They have brought in the Nature Conservancy, they have brought in other local groups. Um, we were asked to, to consult as they start to develop educational um, programming around that location as well. So. Uh, I know I've talked about a lot of stuff um, and a lot of uh, long-term projects, a lot of long-term um, components of engagement, but it is true, right? That it doesn't have to be that experience I just described at the top. It can be this experience, which is continuing to be implemented by a local community um, that has been underserved and in need. So just in conclusion, uh, summing up, it's important to not ignore the social component of that soci socio-ecological system. So, not just about, you know, do we do hard sea walls? Do we do living shorelines? But what do communities need? Um, and how can we hear from them to ensure that any projects that are put in are meeting a full scope of needs, are being resilient sort of across the board, across scales, across time, um, across space. Good community engagement is a long resource intensive process. Uh, against thinking of resilience thinking, right? It is by no means efficient, but does result in more resilient outcomes. Um, I know I mentioned this very briefly, but I think it is essential to understand um, that you will serve as an expert. The communities and community members are also experts. Uh, and then finally, depending on your role uh, in your careers, it may not be possible to be engaged in five, 10 year community engagement processes, but you can always work to identify organizations and leaders who can use and apply your work um, over that longer time span. So that is what I have for you all today. Hopefully some of it was useful and some of the resources will be of interest to you after the fact, but if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, oh, sorry, one more thing. So yeah, a bunch of resources, which I'm sure I will send the slides to Dr. Leonard and you'll have access to. Um, and then I do have actually a final request, which is if anyone has any feedback, um, we do teaching effectiveness forms. So if anyone has any um, uh, thoughts about the presentations, I would love to hear uh, from you all as well. So this link will be in the, uh, the slides. Oh, Kelsey, thank you. That was very um, informative, but also I think very important for everyone to understand that we tend to focus on kind of the environmental structural components to all this. But if you don't have a, 
um, I guess, sustainable social aspect of community, it will not be resilient. Just because it can withstand structurally a storm event doesn't mean that's, that community will stay together and, and come back strong. So I'd like to, um, along with you, open up for questions. I'm sure there are, there are some. Sometimes it takes a minute or so to uh, get those generated. We can either post them to the chat or if somebody wants to just um, begin with their questions in an orderly fashion. Sure, I'll start. <laughs> Go ahead, David. Um, Go ahead, Ali. Right, I'll go ahead. Uh, well, thank you very much for that presentation. Um, it was very um, informative. Um, one thing I'm studying is manage retreat, and I'm just curious how you might approach community meeting for um, a strategy that may seem kind of unpopular to the group, but might be necessary. Is kind of different approach you would have? That's a really good question, and obviously a, a very difficult topic. And I think that comes into that core principle of transparency and trust, which I think, right, it is, it's always worthwhile to present the full scope of, of options um, and explain to people why you've included that as an option and why it might be necessary. It's interesting, um, right, with, with the resilience theory framework, because sort of built into that is also something that's maybe a little counter to the idea of sustainability, which is that like systems change and sometimes keeping things the way they are really isn't the most resilient option, right? Um, and so I think you just, it's still going to be up to the community to decide what they want to do. Um, and so the best thing you can do is, is present that as an option and, and explain why it's, it's something worth considering given what we know, the risks, the uncertainty. Um, and I didn't dive too much into this, um, but yeah, there's a whole other like field right to, to good risk communication and understanding how to um, uh, communicate risk in a way that it's comprehensible to people. So um, there's, I don't know if I included in the slides, but I might send along a, a paper that I really enjoy that includes some good information about um, risk communication. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I kind of similar, similarly to the question that David had, um, when maybe when a community doesn't, and I maybe the reading that you just uh, mentioned could answer this too, but when a community might not understand the the depth of a problem or like the, I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say, but maybe how do you inform them like, well, you guys are worried about this, but there's also this to consider without kind of insulting anyone. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a challenge. And I think that is like the, uh, the sort of tension I was describing around expertise, because I think it's, it's difficult to sort of know what you know and sort of understand the things you understand and not feel like no you don't understand I have to tell you this thing that it should be the most important thing to you um but again you know what we and I, the thing that always comes to mind right is I I come from a planning background so I always think about urban renewal which was this idea right of like we are the experts we know how to create good communities we know what um, your community should look like and Right. We know from history now, an absolute, <laughs> an absolute disaster. Um, and so I, I think it can be difficult to hear back from communities. We're just not interested uh, in doing that right now or that work, but ultimately it is up to, it, sh it should be up to communities to self-determine. So the result may be, and this is again, a little bit different because you're being brought in to do this specific project or you may be contracted to come in to do a specific project. 
but the result may be that you, you move on to a community that does want to do the work and be available to come back if things change. I think it's a it's a difficult assumption to make too because a lot of times communities are really aware even if they don't necessarily seem like it about things that are happening and we're seeing so much particularly around like flooding and coastal resilience over the last I would say even just like four or five years where it is really coming to the forefront of people's minds for better or for worse um that I don't know that that's still like happening a lot which is which is good um, but the only other intervention, right, is taking more time for education and finding ways to really walk people through the process. Um, and there's all kinds of like tools and techniques of like visualization that are being developed, which can be really helpful. Um, you know, everyone's tending towards like VR, right, where you put on the glasses and you can like see the sea level rise in your community, which is sometimes really helpful. Um, so folks are definitely working on the problem of, of how do you show people, right? Because I, I fully agree, you know, you say like, it's a foot of sea level rise. I don't know what, like, <laughs> what, what does that mean? But if you can show the visualization that a foot of sea level rise means the water is going to be here on your home, sometimes that clarifies for people. So um, there definitely are, are tools that are coming online that can help with that education process. Does, I, does that answer the question? I don't know that, you know, with a lot of the stuff that they're like, great <laughs> clear answers to solve the problem unfortunately no no it's a good answer yeah i i hear you for sure thank you okay well, i think allison has a question and then mara so i don't know if they would just go ahead and ask the question themselves allison uh yeah i guess my question is so could efficiency be included in a way or a specific area. So if you considered um, efficiency when planning your, um, just in planning for the Chesapeake Bay as opposed to Hampton or Baltimore in kind of like a wide scale you communicated, would it have negative impacts if it was um, done on more of a broad scale? Um. It's an interesting question. I'm struggling. I think I think the difficulty with um, efficiency specifically is it it's hard to have something that isn't efficient for like a, a broad range of, of goals that's like perfectly optimized and efficient. So I think like definitionally that almost can't, can't be the case if that makes sense. Um, but I do want to say and I forgot to say this right so I showed that example from Dr. Mingley's work, and I'm not trying to make the argument that like riprap is never the correct answer, or a seawall is never the correct answer. I think the it's just uh, something that should be considered, right? Because you're looking up a scale and down the down the scale does not mean that for whatever reason coming out of your analysis that efficient option is not the right option. It's just asking you to consider it as you're, as you're making your plans, um, really. Awesome, thank you. Okay, Mara seems to have a very pertinent question. So Mara, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, so I think the thing I'm always concerned about with community engagement is avoiding over-promising. Um, and you know, like so much of what we make as students in landscape architecture, drawings and ideas and maps and histories and analyses and like those things are all really valuable to me as a student but like I recognize the fact that if you're a community member you might just be like I've been waiting decades for someone to like fix these potholes or like flooding in the middle of the street um so yeah I was just curious what your thoughts are about how to manage expectations about what we're capable of delivering and the value of that to both communities and students, like um, both ways. Yeah. So yeah, I, I hope when I told that anecdote at the top, it was, it was not coming off in any way, like the studio experience isn't worthwhile and, and good and important and shouldn't be part of, of a process. I think, right, so part of it is, um, depending on who you're talking with and who you end up engaging with, setting those clear expectations of like, we are students, this is the purpose of our studio. This is what the outcome is going to be. 
and thinking through the idea of like, this is how it could be used. Because I don't think there's anything wrong or not useful about creating aspirational goals. Because sometimes I think kind of maybe getting to Ellie's point, it is difficult if you don't have expertise in this area to think of like what could be, and that can be helpful um, for framing a planning process, right? So if I am born into the, the Turner Station area and I don't, I wasn't alive when the beach was a beach and I don't remember that and you know, or like I moved there and I didn't know. I might not know that it could be this wonderful amenity with a boardwalk where I could go out and fish and I never thought of it. And now I'm engaged because this is something I want. So I think there is still really um, value to like aiming big and really redesigning and thinking through, even if it isn't that sort of um, <laughs> a granular pothole, like I needed this fix yesterday approach. Um, because I think it can be hard too when you're you're in community you're in your life to think of what is possible. So I do think there's value in that. Thank you. Hey Jack, Jack, can I ask a question? Sure. All right. <clears throat> Excellent presentation, Kelsey. Very well done. Uh, very informative. Thank you. Uh, so, so I'm an economist by training. Uh, and quick plug for my uh, upcoming talk on the 22nd. So maybe I'll lean into that a bit. I'll be honest, I do I just struggle a bit when I when I hear um, it's just a lot of it's all really focused and this sounds it sounds like a great thing, right? Community, community, community. But, but what is the community, right? It's really difficult to define what a community is. And it, in these efforts, it's impossible to involve the entire community and you're going to have a very small, you know, especially if it's a larger city or something or metro area, you're going to have a very small slice of that community. You know, those folks are self-selected. They're in it for different reasons, but they have different value structures and it's almost by definition non-representative. Uh, and then you, furthermore, you have these, these individuals that come together, maybe they do have some differences, but there's like an inherent group dynamic that kind of, uh, you know, directs like the energies into a certain way. Maybe that's good and maybe it's not, maybe it's indifferent, but there's all these different levels of community. Economists think about the individual. What do people, what, is, what does person A want? What does person B want? And this has all been about the community. So can you speak to that tension between the community, which is hard and kind of amorphous, and what is that, versus like, and in my view, it's like the community is, is all the individuals. I think it's almost by definition too. But how do you aggregate individual preferences, if you will, into like this community desire when there is no community in that sense? You know, so if you could just share your thoughts on that, I'd, I'd be really interested to hear that. Yeah, that's a great question, Scott. And I will say I'm looking forward to your presentation next week. <laughs> oh, you can, so, you know, I'll double plug for that. Um, so uh, definitely a difficult question. Some communities are organized, right? Like some people participate actively in sort of hierarchical leadership structures um, that you can identify. And that doesn't capture everyone, right? But you might be able to find um, right, community leaders, and that can be difficult too. Um, EPA just restarted uh, because it's the new Biden administration and there's a big focus on environmental justice, um, uh, their quarterly environmental justice calls. And anyone can call in, like literally any person, and then they can unmute and talk to EPA about what's happening with them. And someone on that call, I think to your point, um, said, you know, EPA needs to do better about reaching real community leaders and not just talking to people who say they represent the community, which is like, well, how do you, how do, you do that, especially from the scale of EPA? And I think similarly, we talk about that all the time with our regional organizations, uh, and I think this gets to the, the problem of, of resources of manpower. If we want to say work with an individual neighborhood, which is still, as you're, you're absolutely right, like not an individual person, not an individual preference, but like, you know, thinking about scales, a smaller structure. 
And then we want to aggregate up from the neighborhood scale to uh, like a congressional or a city council district scale. And then we need to aggregate up to the city scale. And then we need to aggregate up to our regional work. And I don't think anyone has the resources, unfortunately, to, to do that really well. But what you are hoping to get right is some uh, representative sample. It's like any other kind of process, some representative sample of the community so that hopefully you're engaging as broad of an area of interest as you can. And I think to that point, right, of it's particularly difficult to engage people who have felt um, not included in the process and have specifically checked out, which is this like question of advertisement of how do you reach people who aren't already involved in existing networks? Uh, and it's really, really hard. So um, yeah, I, I think to your point, uh, I don't know that anyone is doing it perfectly. Like this is like this ideal, like what does this look like? What are you doing? You're getting everyone's opinion. Um, but um, yeah, it's hard. And I think you're also right, right? Defining community is an important part of the process. And then again, it's that question of like, what scale are you looking at? What scale are you starting from? And then at what scale are you getting a representative sample of your community? Well, thank you for that thoughtful response. Um, and I'm a survey researcher, so I think about this a lot. You know, how, you know, it, are my survey results biased when 25% or 35% folks respond or even 50%? So we do tests to see if it differs by, you know, different demographic characteristics. And, and you got a bigger challenge too, because that community engagement by, by definition is like this face-to-face -face thing where I can mail off 5,000 surveys, right? But you're not, <laughs> you, have a, you have a different challenge in front of you when you get on the ground like you do, right? So it's, it's really interesting. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? If not, then I think we'll bring this to a close. As Scott mentioned, he will be speaking next week and his topic is economics of coastal resource management. So that I will- think that's in two weeks, right, Jack? I believe it's two weeks. Is next week like a break or something? Is that right? That's correct. It is two weeks, the okay. 22nd. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because next week, uh, I think our studio presentations, uh, midterm presentations for a lot of the studios. So any parting comments? Uh, I just want to say thank you, Kelsey. Um, I think your uh, expertise is, is more than welcome in the class. Uh, I hope you will participate uh, as we move forward in any kind of presentations, be available for maybe some email, chatter back and forth from the students uh, when they have some questions. And uh, so I'm going to go ahead. Does everyone have my email, Jack? I can't remember. I can put it in the chat. I realize I didn't put it on any <laughs> of my slides. Yeah, or you can send it to me and I'll post okay. it for the, you know, for the class at a minimum. All right. Yes. If there are any follow-up questions, I'm happy to answer them. And yeah. Thank you again for, for having me. I'm glad to be here. Okay, well, thank you, and I think we'll end at this point. I'm going to stop recording.